Hi, and welcome to Alternative Index Strategies Compared, Fact and Fiction, the latest in a series of webinars developed by Index Universe. I'm Allison Jones, Director of Conferences for Index Universe, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm pleased to be joined on the call today by Jason Sue, Chief Investment Officer for Research Affiliates. In addition to his work at Research Affiliates, where he's worked closely with Rob Arnott to originate the RAFI methodology, Jason is also an adjunct professor in finance at the Anderson School of Business at UCLA and the author of numerous academic and practitioner articles. Joining us as well is one of our very own experts, Dave Nodig, Director of Research at Index Universe. The format today is very straightforward. Jason will spend about 30 minutes or so presenting his findings. Following his presentation, Dave will join in for a period of moderated Q&A to tap into Jason's expertise in alternative beta strategies. As a participant in this webinar, you can enter questions for any of the panelists using the Q&A tool at the bottom right-hand side of your webinar screen. Please, don't wait until the end to ask questions. Submit them as they occur to you. We will collate the questions submitted throughout the webinar and answer as many as we can at the end. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Jason. Jason? Thank you. And it's, it's my pleasure and honor to be on this webinar and to speaking uh, to, uh, to all of you on my latest research, which will be appearing in the next issue of the Financial Analyst Journal. Now, this is joint work with uh, my colleagues, Dr. Vitaly Kolesnik, as well as uh, Mr. Bryce Little and Mr. Zeman Chow. Right now, you should see the slide on your screen for those of you who are following me um, on your laptop. The roadmap for this presentation, um, I'll first of all start with a discussion of the status quo in the indexing community. And then I'll introduce a wide variety of new alternative beta indexing methodologies, describing to you the intuition behind the methodologies, and as well as some of the concerns uh, that I have around some of the construction methodologies. Uh, then I'll go on to show the simulated performances of these methodologies, and at the same time provide you intuition as to the sources of the outperformance and finally, providing you with additional analytics and comparisons so that you can understand how to mix and match or how to compare and contrast these different methodologies. So with that, the status quo within the indexing community largely goes as follows. There is a wide consensus uh, for many indexers that markets are generally efficient. This is why active strategies have had a very difficult time consistently outperform uh, a passive index benchmark. But we also do know from a long academic literature that goes back um, you know, to as early as uh, the 80s where a variety of anomalies uh, have been documented. And then today, there's a, a growing roster of new anomalies that tells us that not only markets like China, India uh, that are emerging, which might be inefficient, even markets like the US, Japan, can be quite inefficient as well. There is another view within the indexing community that cap weighting is one of the most optimal way to construct a passive low-cost investment strategy. And the definition for optimal here uh, is optimal mean variance or optimal sharp ratio, using the language of Harry Markowitz in his seminal work uh, in um, uh, uh, mean variance analysis. However, what we also know now, and we have known this for the last 30 years, is cap-weighted indexing does not actually inherit the optimal characteristics that is stated in the capital asset pricing model. Uh, the connection between the two has largely been a misinterpretation of the theory. So there really is no 
uh, theoretical support to support the view that a cap weight of passive index is optimal in any sense. And then finally, there's also a, a consensus uh, in the indexing community that says cap weighting is a very efficient way of capturing off the relative equity risk exposure and providing a risk premium in return. Now, what we do know now today is the cap-weighted index provides you one dimension of the equity risk premium. That is, it offers you only the market premium as measured by uh, the cap-weighted construct. We have identified many other reliable sources of equity risk premium, such as the value factor premium, the small factor premium, that are currently not being captured by the cap-weighted index uh, and the vehicles that's been created around that indexing concept. And again, this is well documented going back to the research of Fama and French uh, since the early 90s. Given that we've known uh, the suboptimal characteristics of traditional cap weighting, the opportunities for accessing more equity risk premiums by going outside of traditional cap weight indexing, uh, it is only natural to now see an explosion of new beta strategies that deviate from cap weighting. And what I'm looking to do today is to review some of the more commercially successful, uh, some of the strategies that have gained uh, a bit more uh, media press coverage, and to simulate um, the underlying methodologies uh, that are used to create these different commercial products so that you can have a better understanding of the natural risk and return trade-offs for these methodologies, uh, as well as uh, understand more of the critical elements, the important characteristics uh, that underpin these strategies. Again, this is uh, work that is forthcoming in the Financial Analyst Journal, and um, I do want to be very, very careful uh, in, in disclosing uh, the following two points. One is, uh, of course, I represent uh, Research Affiliates. I'm a, a co-founder and the CIO at Research Affiliates, who is the inventor of the fundamental index methodology, or, or sometimes referred to as the RAFI methodology. Uh, so you should just be aware of that and, and be aware of any potentially inherent bias I may have when I, when I look at the space of all uh, alternative equity index strategies. Uh, additionally, it's also very important for me to point out that the methodologies that we're backtesting here do not map exactly into the actual ETFs and index products that have been brought to market by the various vendors. Uh, so my emphasis is to talk about the underlying methodologies and to help you understand the methodologies in, I think, the most intuitive and the cleanest way possible. So I'm not speaking specifically to anyone's actual investment products, which may have many modifications, improvements, and other uh, bills and whistles, which I, I, I am unable to cover due to the scope of the research, and which I, I, I tend to think are not the critical drivers of the long-term risk return success of these strategies. So with that, uh, the way I like to understand the space of all new alternative equity strategies is to view them in the following two categories. Uh, one is what I call heuristics-based strategies, and the other one optimized strategies. Uh, by heuristics weighting, I simply mean portfolio weighting mechanisms that uh, can feel quite intuitive, um, that's not necessarily based on some derivation, uh, it's not an equilibrium uh, economic model, um, these are just simple weighting mechanisms that, uh, that may be appealing from a variety of intuitive perspectives. The optimized strategies are going to be more quantitative, uh, may have an element of black box to it because it does require complicated uh, computer algorithms to get the optimal solution. And I'll go through 
uh, that, that procedure and help you understand why the optimized solution may have uh, some benefits uh, by just by being uh, more complicated and, uh, and then being more uh, quantitatively intensive. The simplest of the heuristic strategies would be uh, equal weighting, something that uh, many of us are very, very familiar with. So I don't need to describe the, the simple mathematics behind how to construct a 1 over n equal weighted portfolio. Uh, interestingly enough, this has been documented as one of the more successful strategies, uh, often outperforming cap weighting and outperforming uh, many of the mean variance optimal quantitative strategies. So it is an important one despite being a very naive one. Uh, I think where people have had struggles and issues with this methodology is when you equal weight, uh, you can and you do tend to emphasize in some of the more illiquid, smaller, lower capacity stocks. And there's also a question of what do you equal weight? Do you equal weight the S&P 500 or do you equal weight the Russell 1000? Or maybe you want to equal weight something a little bit more broad and more representative such as the Russell 3000 or the Wilshire 5000. And depending on what starting universe you use to equal weight, you could arrive at completely different looking portfolios with very different looking turnover characteristics, liquidities, and performances over time. And so um, many people do think that equal weighting may be a little too naive and not robust enough for institutional investment purposes. The extension uh, to simple equal weighting is something that's uh, been proposed by Dr. Fernholtz of Princeton University and who also is a CIO at Intech. Uh, his intuition there is really um, captured in, in the following sense. that You can see it as a blending of equal weighting and cap weighting. On the screen you'll see some complicated mathematical formula, but uh, if you just focus in on uh, the variable P, setting P to zero, the portfolio is just an equally weighted portfolio. Setting P to one, the portfolio is a simple cap weighted portfolio. You can vary P in such a way to blend equal weighting and cap weighting so that you can target a specific level of tracking air to cap weighting if you're sensitive to tracking air. And so this offers a, a, a neat um, mathematical solution to anyone who wants to incorporate some equal weighting into their indexing program but not quite go all the way to full equal weighting because of potentially tracking air sensitivity. Um, a even I think more uh, sophisticated methodology that again uh, is, is related to the equal weighting concept is the category of strategies that I refer to as risk cluster equal weighting. And the idea there is if you think of the world as natural clusters of uh, unique risks, uh, and, and there are some theories that, that would support why that might be a good way to think about the world, uh, so very much an APT world of thinking about risk and markets, then what you might want to do is instead of equal weighting the underlying securities, instead of equal weighting the individual stocks, to equal weight these risk clusters. Uh, the old uh, Deutsche quantitative team, uh, now the, uh, the QS uh, uh, investment team, has devised a, I think, a quite intuitive approach uh, to accomplish risk cluster equal weighting. Uh, the idea is to create risk clusters that are built around the building blocks of country and industry sectors. So really creating uh, a number of these country sector pairings. And once you create these country sector pairings, uh, then you bucket stocks into those country sector pairings and then equal way these country sector pairings. And, uh, and the resulting portfolio will be one that broadly uh, captures the notion of creating risk clusters and then equal weighting them to form a portfolio. 
um, the advantage of this methodology over a more naive equal weighting is that you're less sensitive to the initial universe. So using this methodology, uh, whether your starting universe is, say, a Welcher 5000 or a S&P 500, you would largely arrive at the same risk clusters and equal weighting them would give you very comparable resulting portfolio risk and return characteristics. And finally, there is fundamental indexing strategy, obviously a strategy I, I know quite a bit about and, and one that I'm very fond of. Uh, intuitively, what uh, we are trying to do in fundamental indexing strategy is instead of weighting a portfolio by market capitalization, we weight by a set of accounting size variables. And the intuition for that is our claim that markets are inefficient and therefore weighting a portfolio by these inefficient prices uh, will be suboptimal. Just imagine if you have a stock that's becoming more and more overvalued, therefore garnering a larger and larger market capitalization, the overvalued stocks will artificially take on larger and larger portfolio weights in your cap weighted benchmark. And of course, the undervalues uh, would have lower and lower weights within the portfolio. And that doesn't seem like an optimal way of structuring a portfolio. So by moving away from weighting by the inefficient, incorrect prices that we see in markets and weighting to something based just on backward-looking accounting variables, you're able to sever the link between portfolio weights and prices, and therefore avoid the defect of overweighting overvalued stocks and underweighting undervalued stocks. And by using these accounting variables of size, such as the total sales, the total cash flow, the total dividends, and the book value of the firm, you tend to emphasize in economically large companies, which of course would have large investment capacities, liquidities, and owing to the fact that these accounting variables are going to be slow moving as they generally tend to trend slowly over time, it'll result in low portfolio turnover, which we believe uh, in combination with high capacity and high liquidity will give you something that's easy to implement and very low cost to implement. So these are the heuristic based strategies. Each of them have, I think, an origin in uh, equal weighting, which moves away from price weighting to accomplish uh, greater performances, but then each of them uh, have a unique proposition in offering something more sophisticated, hoping to solve the shortcomings of, of a, a simple, naive, equal weighted strategy. And I'll come back and hit these points again later when we look at the empirical performances and some of the more nuanced characteristics. The optimized strategies uh, generally uh, fall out of Harry Markowitz's 1962 uh, portfolio analysis paper. An the idea there is if you have uh, forecasts on stock returns and you have forecasts on future variance and covariances, you can use those information to build a most efficient portfolio, an optimal portfolio that gives you the best risk-return trade-off as measured by uh, Sharpe ratio, which is just the uh, excess return over uh, volatility. Now, of course, this is a fine idea. If we have those uh, starting point ingredients, we, we, of course, would want to build this optimal portfolio. The challenges, and, and really we have tried this in the last 50 years since the, the original publication of the paper, the challenges are it is very difficult to forecast future stock returns. And even the variance covariance matrix, which is a little easier to estimate statistically, can be quite unstable over time. So those two ingredients, those two inputs, are very hard to come by, and they tend to be almost too noisy to lead to a good outcome. So you are going to have to modify the methodology quite aggressively uh, to, to actually arrive at a, a workable uh, portfolio. What the literature uh, has looked at uh, is to reduce one dimension of the complexity by ignoring 
uh, the exercise of forecasting future stock returns. And if you simply assume, well, all stocks may have roughly the same expected returns, or at least we don't know enough to, to, uh, to argue why one stock may or should have higher return versus the next, then you could uh, make the, the mean variance problem significantly easier. And it actually looks like creating a minimum variance portfolio, which I think over the last few years has become quite popular. So you can think of minimum variance as a optimal mean variance solution when you don't have any knowledge about stock returns. And, and so that's one reasonable way to, to execute on Harry's uh, original portfolio methodology. And as we'll discover later, it does come with some very attractive risk return benefits as well. Of course, um, uh, many practitioners are uncomfortable assuming that we know nothing about returns. After all, it's, it's almost 90% of our jobs is to, to, to forecast and to understand and to say something about equity risk premium and to, to say something about how stocks are different in the cross sections. Uh, so there are a number of providers who now make a, a, a assumption, one that's a naive, but that does have some intuitive appeal which is to assume that expected stock returns are related to the volatility of the stock. Now, I just want to caveat, you know, from a, a, a business school professor's perspective, this goes in, in stark contradiction against the capital asset pricing model, which says total volatility really doesn't matter. It's the systematic volatility or the beta that matters. But uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to accept that this is another interpretation, and we simply would have to take a look at the empirical output of this particular methodology uh, and then and then comment on whether this assumption makes sense or not makes sense. So if you make the assumption that expected stock returns are a simple linear function of the total volatility of a stock, just making that very simple assumption is enough to help you solve the mean variance optimal program uh, in, a, in a very straightforward way and arrive at a, at a portfolio uh, which would generally give more weight to the, lower vol uh, to the higher volatility stocks because they're expected to have higher returns. Uh, you can be even more sophisticated than that. Uh, investors probably don't really see the entire volatility as risk. The upside volatility might not feel so bad. You, you don't really care whether you get 5% positive return or 10% positive return as long as it's positive. You don't think that's very risky. It's really the downside volatility that maybe uh, would feel uncomfortable and therefore earn a risk premium. Uh, so someone has uh, walked down that path of, of, uh, of logic and assumed, well, maybe expected returns are only related to the downside volatility. And of course, this assumption is a, a assumption that only makes a difference if you believe stock returns are not uh, normal or not symmetric uh, on the downside versus the, da uh, the upside. And again, we'll come back and review whether this particular assumption provides you with something extra in terms of better risk return payoff uh, when we take a look at the empirical analysis. So I've covered uh, in fairly broad strokes uh, what I believe are the interesting and, and the more commercially successful methodologies uh, that, that products have been launched uh, around. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to look at the simulated performances of these strategies. I'll look at the U.S. Uh, research data as well as the global research data, what I hope to impress upon you is that uh, the analyses that I present are robust. Uh, you'll see the same patterns in the U.S., you'll see the same pattern globally, you'll see the same pattern uh, in individual underlying countries, and we have recently completed research using uh, emerging markets and emerging market countries independent, uh, individually to, to show that the analysis that you, you will see over the next few slides are very, very robust. So here it goes. Uh, on slide number 19, I show uh, 
just the return and the associated volatility of the different strategies and compare that against the uh, S&P 500 benchmark. So this is looking at the U.S. data. This goes back to 1964, which is uh, as early back as uh, I have data available for this exercise. So this will, of course, uh, you know, give you some degree of statistical reliability given how long the data set is. And I would also um, uh, simply uh, alert you to the fact that this will be much longer than many of the simulation that you'll see from the different product providers. Uh, so again, I think that does give you a bit more of the uh, the long horizon risk return characteristics than what you might find in some of the commercial disclosures. So here it goes. What you see is that the total returns for these strategies are universally better than the cap weighted benchmark. Some by as much as 200 basis points or more and some slightly less. What I want you to focus in on right now is not the magnitudes of outperformance but simply that they all seem to outperform because that is a big puzzle. Uh, if you compare these arguably transparent, naive construction strategies that doesn't involve, involve any forecasting, that doesn't involve any particular stock picking skill or complicated valuation modeling, the fact that they can all outperform the cap with a benchmark and that many active managers with lots of research and lots of experiences are unable to do so consistently, that's got to be pretty surprising. And we'll come back and explore why that might be the case. Let me jump ahead and show you the global results. Again, comparing the strategies uh, using the global data, uh, identical methodologies with no modifications, no recalibrations, just reapplying them to the global database. Again, we see across the board outperformance against the cap-weighted benchmark. There's a bit more dispersion here, but again, statistically you expect there to be some dispersion uh, in the outperformances switching from one region to another region. What I, again, don't want you to focus too much on is does this strategy work better in the U.S.? Maybe it works better in developed markets. Maybe one strategy works better than, uh, than another in emerging markets. You know, we don't have evidence for that. What we do have evidence for is they all seem to outperform, regardless of what markets uh, we observe this in. And so that's really the key message. They all seem to outperform, and it's puzzling. How can that be? Why is that the case? Well, let's take a look. What I am showing you on slide number 20 uh, is the very familiar uh, factor analysis of these strategies. So what I'm using here is referred to either as the Carhartt four-factor model or the Fama French plus momentum factor model. This is very standard in uh, the academic literature. And in fact, I'm sure for many of you who are more quantitative oriented who, or who uses a, a consultant who is quantitatively oriented, you'll see these reports very often. Uh, essentially, we decompose the sources of the outperformance into uh, having exposure to the market beta, having exposure to small stocks, having exposure to value-oriented stocks, and having exposure to momentum stocks. What is key here is if you look at the alpha column, none of these strategies have a statistically significant alpha. And that can be seen in the parentheses underneath the numbers. We need to see um, a number that's closer to zero to indicate statistically significant alpha. And so none of these strategies have significant alpha. What does that mean? Well, that means there really isn't any true innovation in terms of new exposure that you are getting through these new beta strategies. Generally, they do provide you uh, exposure to the market beta. Many of them provide you exactly a unit one exposure to the market beta, so they give you the same exposure as what an S&P would along the market dimension. But then, in addition, many of them provide you added exposure to uh, smaller stocks within the S&P universe, to the more value-oriented stocks within the S&P universe, and generally, you know, 
very weak momentum characteristic that we can largely ignore for this presentation. And if you look at the R-square, what it tells us is, yeah, these factors almost exactly explain what's going on. So you're largely creating value add by shifting toward reliable sources of equity returns in small cap investing and value investing. There isn't more than that uh, in what's going on in these strategies. And that's, again, true globally. Looking down the factor uh, analysis table, fundamental indexing here does show a statistically significant and large alpha. But I, I want to caveat that this is not because I believe it is somehow unique. In a statistical analysis, you're going to see an outlier. And fundamental indexing is just an outlier in this batch of backtests. If you use a different time period, maybe a different region, one of the other strategies might very well show a statistical significance in its Fama French Alpha. So I just want you to be aware that this is not cherry-picked to make fundamental index look better. I would say the fundamental index here is just a outlier experience for the global comparison. Outside of that, again, you see that many of these strategies generally have a positive and significant loading to the small cap or the value factor, and that's what's driving the added performance over time. So what can we conclude from that? Many of these different strategies, whether it's heuristic space, whether it's optimized, all seem to tell a different story. They bring to the table, you know, different bills and whistles. Some a little jazzier than others, some a little naive. But I think from the factor analysis, what we can conclude is none of these stories appear to result in something that's really, really different from each other. They all seem to result in a portfolio that derives its added performance from exposure to small stocks and value-oriented stocks. Does that then make these strategies meaningful, valuable? Is that a contribution to our industry? Since we know uh, small cap as an investing style is successful over time, and we certainly know that value is successful over time. Well, I would argue, offered in passive indexing construct that's aimed to be low cost and easy to implement, this is a very valuable addition or these strategies are a contribution to what is already out there because the existing traditional uh, style indexes, the traditional value indexes, the traditional small cap indexes, if you were to actually uh, run the Fama French analysis on them, you will actually discover negative alpha. And this is very surprising, but it is true. And what drives that, I would offer the following interpretation, what drives that negative alpha of traditional value indexes and traditional small cap indexes is that they're cap weighted, meaning within the universe of value stocks, the cheap stocks, by cap weighting, you then reemphasize on the more expensive of the value stocks, the more expensive of the small cap stocks. And that's going to erode away from the natural premium associated with um, tilting your portfolio toward small and tilting your portfolio toward value. So these new strategies, uh, while not showing a positive and significant Fama French Alpha, at least don't have negative alphas. And I think that's, a, that's actually a, a major contribution. And you really wouldn't expect these strategies to have Fama French Alpha anyways, because there's not an element of forecasting or stock picking or true active management skill there. So you would not expect a Fama French Alpha, which is really historically used to identify active management skill. So I think that part really is intuitive and should not be surprising. Well, let's take a look at the slide on 23, which are, are my favorite tables because they're very surprising. Some of the strategies I talked about before um, are based on a, a theory that says, oh, volatility is risk, and risk should carry a risk premium. Well, we can think about, is that true? 
that's an interesting question to think about because that will be very illustrative of what is really making these strategies work. So if you think volatility is risk and care, therefore carries a risk premium, building a portfolio that's just naively weighted by volatility, meaning I give the most weight to the most volatile stocks. If you do that, you'd expect, okay, you have a more volatile resulting portfolio, but because volatility should give you some compensation for risk, you also expect a higher return. If you look at the second line, in the top and bottom table, volatility weighting does give you higher volatility, so that part is true, and gives you higher return. So it looks like I'm onto something. I got a good theory going on. But if you look on the, the next line, what if I weight the portfolio by the inverse of the volatility? Well, you get lower volatility. That's intuitive. What is not intuitive, though, is you also get outperformance. You also get higher return in the cap-weighted portfolio. So what's going on? Is volatility related to higher return, or is volatility related to lower return? I mean, this is very surprising. It seems to be related to volatility is related to higher return, and inverse of volatility is also related to higher return. And that can't mathematically work out. And of course, that's really not the case. What I believe is happening here is cap weighting gives you suboptimal returns because weights and prices are tied together. That leads to overweighting overvalued stocks and underweighting undervalued stocks. If you move away from price weighting and move to something that's not based on price, you are going to sever the link between price and portfolio weights and therefore reduce that defect of cap weighting. Volatility, not correlated with recent price fluctuations, and therefore inverse of volatility, not correlated with price fluctuation. So whether you weight by volatility or weight by inverse of volatility, whether you weight by covariances or you weight by inverse of covariances, you get better performances because you're severing the relationship between price and portfolio weights. And that, I think, is what's driving all of the strategies that we're looking at, is that they all sever the link between portfolio weights and prices, allow you to then structurally outperform uh, a price-weighted strategy that would suffer inherent return drag from overweighting overvalued stocks. And we now also have a lot of academic theory that says this severing of portfolio weights from prices or a rebalancing against price mechanism is really what's driving uh, what we observe to be the value and small cap factor premium. And so there's really now an integrated theory that says, well, why do all these seemingly different strategies have loadings on small and value? Well, it's because they're all not price weighted and are rebalancing against price, and that will mathematically lead to exposure on small cap and value uh, in terms of factor exposures. So with that, uh, we have also looked at um, uh, other characteristics associated with these strategies. And very quickly, uh, we don't find increasing rebalancing strat uh, increasing the frequency of rebalancing to matter. It, it will only increase turnover, but does not improve return. So when you look at these strategies, you want to make sure that uh, you buy the lowest turnover version as that's, that's available out there. Uh, in terms of the size of the universe, you generally want a strategy to start with a universe that contains a lot more stocks because that will give you more opportunity within your investment opportunity set for these strategies to be successful in. And, uh, and you should also be careful that many of these strategies that might be more optimized will have parameters that you as an investor will get com have to get comfortable with and will have to know where those parameters come from and potentially even play an active role in setting those parameters because they will have very critical impact on the resulting portfolios because optimization as a me mechanism is very, very sensitive to some of these uh, simple parameter changes. Now, other characteristics that I think are incredibly important to focus on, especially given the realization that these strategies are, in a way, all very related and related 
in a way that, that almost make them replaceable parts for each other. You can simply combine a fundamental index and an equal weighted index to get to minimum variance. Or you can combine minimum variance and some of the optimized strategies to maybe get to fundamental index. Because they're all really uh, just exploiting um, the value small cap and the market beta. So linear combinations of them will get you to um, each other. So they can mimic each other. So what you really want to focus on is as you mix and match and try to create your own optimal alternative beta portfolio mix, you want to pay special attention to turnover. Some of these strategies that are more optimized will have a lot higher turnover, and that's just a characteristic of uh, constrained optimization. You're going to have a lot of turnover and some unpredictable and potentially unintuitive turnovers. And that's what we've been hearing with uh, people who run minimum variance strategies is you're going to have to put in a lot of ad hoc constraints to keep the portfolio well behaved. And that you know may or may not be comfortable for you and your clients. Uh, having to deal with with those type of constraints and uh, and 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 otherwise uh, much higher turnover without those constraints. What you really uh, also want to uh, pay careful attention to is the implied cost of implementing these strategies. Of course, they outperform in a gross versus gross uh, comparison, but depending on the management fees and more importantly the Im implied transactions fees. Uh, that could erode a significant portion of the, the outperformance. So you need to pay attention to the capacity uh, as measured by weighted average market capitalization, uh, liquidity as measured by bid-ask spread, and as measured by the weighted average trading volume. And again, you see uh, many of the optimized strategies will tend to have um, less attractive bid-ask spread because the optimization routine can often prefer stocks that are a little bit more stale, don't trade as often because they're going to look like they're less correlated with other stocks. And so you're, you're going to inadvertently pick up some illiquidity uh, as a result of that. And here I would argue many of the more heuristics based, uh, like fundamental indexing or what we call diversity, which is really a blend of cap and equal weighting, they'll generally tend to give you the best liquidity and weighted average capitalization because of the emphasis on um, size. So concluding, I want to leave us some time for Q&A. Concluding, um, we believe markets are not efficient. And if markets are not efficient, I think it's wrong to use cap weighting as a way of building your passive portfolio. And therefore, uh, you want to explore other ways of building a portfolio. There are many, many solutions out there today. Uh, I argue they're all similar to each other. I'm going to use the word isomorphic. And that just means, they're, they're, regardless of their story, their outperformance characteristics come from their accessing the value premium and the small cap premium. And, uh, and you want to make sure uh, that you believe those premiums are consistent uh, for you to believe in these products. And uh, once you can get past that point, then really I think the primary focus should be low cost in implementing the strategy, low management fee, and buy the product or combination of products that have the greatest liquidity capacity and the lowest turnover. Well, with that, I, I, I'd love to open this up to, uh, to some questions because I see a lot of questions queuing up already. Sure, Jason. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. I mean, this has been really interesting research to follow. I know you've been working on this for a while, and, and you know, we've had a chance to look at some of the early drafts as you've progressed. Um, and, and I have to say, honestly, I think it's uh, it's fairly brave research, honestly, given uh, given you know the background and the work that you've done on fundamental indexing. And I think that um, you know the idea that implementation is so important here is is kind of revolutionary in a way. I mean, it's not revolutionary in the sense that I think index investors know, or or at least have bought into the idea that keeping costs down is is important. But but when you start thinking about implementing these kinds of strategies, I, I inevitably end up thinking about things like, well, what's the right rebalancing window? And, and have you done any work on on really digging into sort of various rebalance windows for each of these and trading costs, or, or is that sort of outside the scope of what you've looked Absolutely. at so far? This is very important. I think it's one of the most important things to look at, which is the turnover, and a huge part of turnover is going to be driven by the rebalancing frequency. Um, there are products out there 
um, that have quarterly rebalancing, um, semi-annual rebalancing to annual rebalancing, and then the question is, does it make a difference? Well, from our research, we've looked at all these strategies, rebalancing annually, quarterly, semi-annually, monthly. What we've discovered is you don't get return improvements by rebalancing more often. In fact, you have a return decrement because you'll be trading against uh, some intra-year stock price momentum, and we know that's a bad idea. But probably what rebalancing more frequently is going to cost you is the higher turnover, particularly with some of the strategies where the turnover can be quite high at each rebalance and where the liquidity is not very good with some of the underlying stocks, um, the higher frequency rebalancing, I think, is very detrimental. There's just no theory or empirical evidence to support that somehow rebalancing more frequently helps because this is not an active strategy. There's no information loss or degradation over time. So rebalancing slower, there's no reason to, to, to believe that that would lead to a bad outcome. Does, we actually have a question that's sort of an interesting follow-up to that from the audience, which is when you sort of extract this from the universe that you've looked at here, right, which is, which is uh, you know, equities, um, do you think that this applies across asset classes? I mean, I think many investors are used to the idea of rebalancing from a portfolio level, you know, selling, selling your stocks when they've, they've run so that you can buy more bonds if they've failed, right? Do you think that that kind of, regularly, that kind of rebalancing strategy or, or the work that you've done here applies at the whole portfolio level, or do you think this is really just sort of an equity premium extraction uh, you know, thing that you've discovered here? It absolutely applies to the whole portfolio level. Um, and, and we just now have so many uh, new empirical uh, research that, that are, are showing the benefits of discipline rebalancing. And then we're developing theories around that as well. And it's largely a theory of you know, prices can, can be wrong, too optimistic, too pessimistic. So rebalancing helps you pocket um, uh, some of the gains that's associated with, say, uh, uh, you know, exuberant optimism or, or pessimism. And, and so this, is, this methodology works across asset classes. We, we've seen other researchers that support that claim. Uh, this works in equities. It's a great way of capturing some of the equity premium that's associated with value and size um, that you can capture on rebalancing. It works if you just apply it only to fixed incomes for rebalancing bonds within a bond index. But across asset classes, absolutely, we see that as well. And, and you know, the other, the other thing, um, you know, I sort of was looking at the scope of your research, and you've looked at a, a pretty long time set here. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a quant geek, too, so I love working with big chunks of data like that. But one thing I always worry about when I look at studies that sort of dig back into the 60s and 70s and even to the 80s to some extent um, is that the assumption here has to then be that past is in some way prologue, right, that the, the value you're extracting by looking at this data from the 60s and 70s and 80s is relevant to apply it to the current equity markets. Now, with the risk of saying this time is different, um, do, does, this, does this look any different when you say look at the experience we've had in the last decade as opposed to the last 50 years? Yeah, absolutely. And in the, uh, in the journal article, uh, you also see tables that show you decade by tech decade. And what you see is across the different decades, the experiences are very similar. All these strategies seem to be successful in the, the, uh, the recent decades as much as so as in the earlier decades. And I think it's a, that's, that's a testament to uh, really the amount of noise and mispricing that are present in the markets today uh, and that, that were equally present in the markets uh, many <laughs> decades ago. Right, right. So you know, the market's always wrong. I mean, that that speaks to you know one of the one of the big takeaways, right? At the at the real layman's level, here is the optimal strategy is anything but cap waiting. <laughs> I think I mean, so. I really do believe that. I do you do you think that uh, you know you, you you dismiss cap waiting very early on in your presentation by sort of saying that ca that cap waiting is is sort of a misapplied thinking about the capital asset pricing model or about the efficient market hypothesis but but isn't isn't it a bit by definition part of that because you know the reason Microsoft is worth x billion dollars is because the markets have voted with their capital to make it that big mhm mm mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh, so um, I, I, I should I should pay some respect to 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 the market because it does work fairly well. I mean, first order approximation, you know, markets got it fairly right. Um, it's really at the at the margin. Is Microsoft, you know, a a, a you know worth 
thirty dollars a share, or is it worth thirty-five to twenty-five? Um, well, that I don't think the market is is always right, and that I think the market can can get it quite wrong from time to time, and certainly it it, it changes its opinion very frequently. And it's that aspect of the inefficiency that I think leads to a bad outcome in cap weighting, because you, you you're essentially always um, being pulled into the more expensive stocks and pulled away from the cheaper stocks, and you compound that across the 500 stocks in S&P and across multiple years. Uh, so it's consistently doing the wrong thing, even if it's not very wrong by a wide margin. If you consistently do it across many, many, many stocks and across a long time, that adds up and really starts to chip away at the fair risk premium that you can earn. Right. Right. I think that's fair. I want to hit a couple of audience questions before we run out of time here. We have a whole bunch of questions that, that hit on something that you, you briefly touched on in your presentation, but maybe we can dig in a little bit more. Um, you know, one interpretation of your work here could be that the, the, the real value here, to pardon overusing that word, um, the, the real juice here is from that value premia or that small cap premia. So why not just use small cap indexes? Why not just use value indexes? I mean, is there really that much to be gained? Um, now, you mentioned that, uh, you know, part of the reason, say, the small cap indexes themselves don't do so well uh, is because they themselves are often market cap weighted. But clearly, that's something you could address as well. Definitely. So um, there, there are really a, a couple of uh, important points that I want to hit here. One is. If you just line up a fundamental index or, or many of these other indexes against a value index or against a small cap index or somehow blending the two of them, what you'll see is, um, and then this is uh, research that's been uh, done by uh, Wilhelm Bernstein, uh, you cannot r replicate what these strategies offer with just a simple combination of you know small cap and value and and the s p five hundred and part of that is because all those indexes are still cap weighted and as long as you're cap weighted you're going to have some return defect associated with you know giving more weight to the more expensive value stocks giving more weight to the more expensive small stocks uh, and then so that that i think and this is why um, we, we we haven't seen research that says yeah you could you could really ex ante compare just combine some small cap and some value and some S and P and and be done with it um, that just you know doesn't 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 work and and that part of that is because you know small cap and value uh, indices are cap weighted and they actually have a negative five French alpha. Well, but but wouldn't couldn't that simply be solved by? I mean, if we're looking ahead, right? I I, I actually think that this work is going to have some ripple effects in the indexing community as people start rethinking, um, you know, rethinking how they're constructing their indexes. Why wouldn't you then, as an index provider, for instance, make a pure value index which is no longer cap weighted, but is in and of itself, you know, weighted using some other metric, even if it was simply naively equally weighted. That I agree. So, 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 Dave, I think if um, you know, index providers uh, understand um, what I'm saying and understand many of the new researchers that are pointing at about the same thing, uh, I think they they would uh, probably want to revise their methodology and go away from cap weighting and 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 in a way, I guess, you know, create uh, kind of pure style alternative indexes. And then I think those would would be very very successful and interesting. So a couple, um, a couple of maybe tougher questions on on some of the research here um, coming in from from folks in the in the audience. Um, you know, you you point out that you know none of these strategies really offered uh, any kind of statistically significant alpha for the U.S. market. Um, but if you look at it simply their risk and return, one could look at them and say, well, they're all you know highly correlated to the S and P 500. Most of them seem to simply be taking a little bit more risk to get a little bit more return. If that's all you're doing, can't you simply achieve that effectively by leveraging up the underlying strategy? I mean, is 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 this simply taking more risk to get more return out of the same asset pool? So, so from the the risk story, um, so there are kind of two dimensions. So let me address the leverage question first. If you just kind of lever up the S and P a little bit, so you're taking a little bit more of the the market beta risk, that doesn't work, and it doesn't work in the following sense, in that of the three sources of risk premium, kind of market beta, uh, small, 
uh, and, and value, market beta has the weakest premium. So if you just lever up the weakest premium, you're not going to get a good bang for the buck. And also, you don't get diversification across the different premium sources. So now back to the question of, would you consider taking exposure to value and small as a way of increasing portfolio risk and therefore earn more risk premium? That's actually uh, a very debated issue. And then I, I, I'm in the camp, uh, and so that's why I'm going to cite a lot of evidence why I think you know small cap and value are more anomalies than risk. And then there's just really a lot of evidence that points to that interpretation. And if you believe that interpretation, now, value stock is not risky. Value stock is actually cheaper. If you believe that interpretation, then then you do want to access that source of premium, right? If there's some freebies left on the table for whatever reason right. that allows you to buy just cheap stocks in the portfolio, I think that's a good idea. And uh, and, and then so, you know, I, I wouldn't rush into the, oh, it's just taking more risk. I would agree, yes, you, you are systematically tilting toward, toward cheaper stocks, and then that seems to be a, a good strategy. However you get to that, that seems to be a good strategy. <laughs> right. Again, back to the anything but cap weighting uh, <laughs> system here. Um, now, I mean, you went out of your way in this presentation, and we certainly appreciate it not to be talking in depth about um, any one particular strategy and its pros and cons. Um, I mean, you did, in the very beginning, you talked about sort of what some of these fundamental optimization methodologies are. Um, but, but when we're looking at things like fundamental indexing, we're looking at how you actually create these weight differences between uh, between stocks, right? And equal weighting be the mo being the most naive. Uh, if really all that matters uh, is where that portfolio ends up on the value and uh, and market cap spectrum, why then look at a whole bunch of other accounting metrics to get to that same portfolio? Wouldn't it make more sense to simply measure each stock based on its market cap and its value, you know, where it fits on the value spectrum, uh, and use that as the fundamental weighting mechanism? Yeah, and so there is actually a reason for doing that, in that. Yes, the intuition is just move away from price weighting. And really, if you move away from price weighting, you're guaranteed to move up on the value spectrum. And that just I can kind of show you mathematically why that's the case. So, well, you know, why make it very complicated? Well, you know, I guess some of the strategies are complicated, you know, because maybe complication is just sexier. But um, in, in, <laughs> in what I try to do is I know, well, you know, you, you do want some constraint in that, uh, I want to move away from price weighting and move up the value curve, but in a very careful way so that I still have very, very low turnover, very, very high trading capacity, and very low uh, uh, bid-ask spread. So I, just, I want to move in a way that, that doesn't lose those benefits. And, and I think moving along the dimension of accounting fundamentals sort of gets you that in a very easy way, right? Companies with very large accounting fundamentals generally are big companies with big liquidity, big capacity, um, lots of shares traded, so low bid-ask spread. And so that's one way of making sure you're moving away from price, moving up the value uh, spectrum, but without losing other good characteristics of traditional indexing. Okay, that's fair enough. I, I mean, one one set of questions we've gotten here, and we've gotten just tons of great questions so far. And unfortunately, I think we're pro this is probably going to be the last one, as I think we're hitting the end of our time. Um, you know, the the idea. Um, Sorry, the the idea here that that uh, you know we we are just sort of creating these accounting level skews at the at the portfolio level. When you start thinking about things like country weights, mm -hmm. um, you know how much sh should you be in say the United States versus China? Um, you know we had we had um, Malkiel on talking about China uh, a few months ago, uh, and and his argument was that virtually any system that's looking at things like uh, market cap or even accounting measurements is going to just statistically underweight China unless you just go to GDP. I mean, have you given any thought to sort of those types of decisions in these processes? Absolutely. And so, so you know, I, I was always a big fan of GDP weighting because, you know, it uh, doesn't let capitalization come into play in terms of determining country weights, which, of course, allows you to avoid a big Japan bubble. But if you think about GDP weighting, right, GDP for many, many of the markets, or at least any markets of any, you know, significance uh, are very correlated with corporate production, right? Corporate earnings is a huge part uh, of, of the GDP production. And so if you 
do fundamental weighting and you aggregate that up, you actually do get GDP weighting. And so I, I'm a big proponent that that is the, the right way to get country weights. And if you do kind of corporate-based fundamental weighting, aggregate up, you're going to get a lot of exposure uh, to Chinese companies because they sure have fantastic earnings, fantastic earning growth, and then produces a lot of things. And uh, and so I think you know the, the the fundamental weighted strategy will get you to GDP weighting, which I think does and will make Bert comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, super. Unfortunately, that's that's it. We've run out of time for today. Jason, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone. And uh, I, I encourage everybody to join us next week. We're going to be talking about broad-based commodity strategies. And uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you soon. Thank you.